What we have now is a multi-tenant application and all the tenants share the same database. What if we want to have each tenant on a different database? That's what we're going to do in this video. This video is provided by the Nano ASP.NET Boilerplate, a web application starter kit perfect for SaaS and MVP projects in .NET. In part one, we built a simple CRUD application with a single controller for products and it supported multi-tenancy through use of a query filter in the DB context. There's a link to that video in the description and also a link to the repo of that project. We'll use that as the starting point for this video. First thing we want to do is go into the tenant entity and we want to add a new field connection string. And we'll allow this to be null. Then we're going to want to jump into our current tenant service. This is the service that's used by our tenant resolver middleware and in this service what we did was we looked up the tenant, made sure it existed, and then we assigned the tenant ID this value. So we want to add another value here. We want to add a connection string which we should also add to the interface. And now in this part here, we're going to set the connection string when there is one along with the tenant ID. And the next step then is in our application DB context. In this context, we're injecting this current tenant service. That's how we were getting the tenant ID. And so we're going to do something very similar. Just going to add current tenant connection string here and grab that value from the current tenant service. Now in our last tutorial, we added this on model creating override and we also added this save changes override. And this is what got multi-tenancy working. Now in order to enable this multi-tenancy functionality across multiple databases, we also need another override. And this is the one we're gonna add on configuring. This fires on every request. So every time that a request comes in, we're going to check and see if this tenant has their own specific connection string. And if they do, we'll tell our database context in that instance to use that connection string. Otherwise, if it's null, it'll just use the default connection string. So that's really the core logic of multi-database multi-tenancy. We have to think about now, though, the deal with migrations. We need to be able to apply any pending migrations to all of these tenant databases and we need to manage that at app startup and also when we create new tenants. So in the last tutorial, we just manually created tenants by adding records in our database. So we're going to need to create a new service for creating tenants and whenever we create a new tenant, we want to make a database for them and apply any pending migrations so that their database is up to sync with the application design. The next thing we need to consider is there are certain tables that we don't want to create in the tenant specific databases. The tenant specific databases should have application related tables like products, but some tables like tenants they should not be created in the tenant specific databases. A table like that should only exist in the central database. So how can we manage that? Well, in our last tutorial, we used this tenant DB context to look up tenants in our middleware. We're going to keep using this context for that, but we're also going to manage migrations with it. We're going to manage migrations of tables that should only be created in the central database. So in application DB context, we can actually remove this DB set for tenants. Uh, let's go ahead and remove all of the migrations that we had before. And I've already deleted the, the database that I had here. And so let's go ahead and recreate some new migrations. I'm gonna put in this command, add migration, give it a name, initial, pass in the context, tenant db context, and the output directory, migrations slash tenant db. This will create a new folder in migrations called tenant db, and here's our initial migration. 
So now let's go and update the database and pass the context, tenant DB context. And now if we go to SQL Server, it's created a new database and we have a tenants table. Now let's go and let's create a migration for the application DB context. So I'm going to do a similar command, add migration, initial, give it the context, this time application DB context, and then the output directory, migration slash app DB. Let's go ahead and update the database, give it the context, application DB context. And now if we go and refresh our database in the Explorer, we can see that now we have the products table also. Now let's go ahead and start creating our tenant service and you'll see why this separation of migration management is important. So I'm going to create a folder. I'm going to call this tenants service or tenant service. I'm going to add a new interface, itenant service, and I'm going to add a new class, the tenant service. The tenant service is going to have one method, just create tenant. And let's go ahead and create a DTO for the create tenant request. So I'm going to add a new folder and a new class. And the create tenant request is going to take an ID and a name and a Boolean value of isolated. And now let's go ahead and create the service. So we're going to want to bring in the context from tenant DB context, the app configuration, and the app service container. And let's implement our interface. And we're going to want a field for the connection string. We're going to be building a connection string in the case that the tenant is an isolated tenant. And ultimately, we're going to be creating a tenant entity which will retrieve the ID and name from our request and then save a connection string. And then we're going to use our tenant context to add that tenant to the database and save the changes and we'll return the tenant. Now in the case that the request isolated is true, so in the case that we want to create a tenant on its own database, we need to take some additional steps. Otherwise, we'll just create the tenant with a null connection string and it'll use the default connection string. So there's two things we need to do here in this case. One, we need to generate a connection string for the new tenant database. And two, we need to create the new tenant database and we need to bring it current with any pending migrations from application DB context. So here's the code for generating a new connection string. We'll create a new name with this prefix. You can make this prefix whatever you want. And we'll join that with the ID of the tenant. Here, we'll get the default connection string. And on this next line, we're just going to replace the name of our database with this new name that we've constructed. And now on this next part, we'll wrap it in a try catch block. And using the service provider, we'll pull down an instance of the DB context for application DB context. And here, we'll set our new connection string on that context. Then we'll see if there are any pending migrations, which there will be, because this database doesn't exist. And then we'll apply any of those pending migrations, and that'll create our new database up to sync with the current application design. Okay, so now let's create a controller for this service. Create an empty API controller, and we'll call it tenants controller. We'll just have one post endpoint where we can create a new tenant. Here we've got the constructor where we inject the tenant service. Now let's not forget to register this service. So this is in the program CS file, and we'll just register that service as a transient service here. Now we can run our application, and we'll go to Postman, 
to test this, we'll send a create tenant request, which needs an ID, a name, and a Boolean for if this tenant should be on their own database. So let's go send this. And here is our response. We've got the ID, the, the name, and a new connection string. And you can see that it built this connection string like we intended. So now if we go to SQL Server, we should see a new database. And there we go. So we've got the central database, and then we have this uh, tenant database. Now this one should only have a products table. And boom, it does. It only has a products table. And the central one should have the products and tenants, which it does. Let's create a product now. And we're just specifying the tenant in the header here. So I'm going to change this value to alpha and the body, the new product request. So let's go ahead and send that. And it's successfully created a product for the tenant alpha. It should save that data in this database, not the main one. And there it is. Let's create another tenant. Let's just create a beta and let's make that its own database. Okay, and then let's make one. Let's make one on the shared, on the main database. So I'll go ahead and send that one. Now, if I go and I create another product, and this is for the beta tenant. Okay, I'll create that. Let's create a product for the root tenant. Okay, uh, and now let's see where we're getting uh, these records created. So in the main database, we should see that laser shark. Yes, and the other tenants should have their own databases and their products should be in there. And they are. And so now let's try to read some products. Let's get a products. Let's get the products from alpha. This data is coming from alpha's database. If I change this to beta, we're going to see products from beta. And the same with the shared. If I change this to root, we're returning data from the main database. And if we stored more tenants on the shared database, our query filters will still be doing their job. So we'll still have that multi-tenancy, that data isolation within shared databases. So now we have a lot of this working. It does get a little bit more complicated when you throw in identity into the mix, but the boilerplate, the nano boilerplate, has all that already, plus 22 endpoints, a lot of great stuff, a lot of great infrastructure. Definitely check that out. Now, the last remaining bits that we need to take care of are the migrations. How do we manage migrations in a multi-database setup? Well, what we need to do is we need to create an extension method that taps into the app startup and applies any migrations that are pending to all of the databases. And that is gonna look quite similar to what we did here. It's kind of the same idea, except that we're gonna loop through all of the existing databases and apply migrations if there's anything pending. So let's go ahead and create a new folder. We'll call it extensions. And I'm gonna create a new class. I'm gonna call this class multiple database extensions. And so this is how you set up an extension method. And in this extension method, we want to do three things. First, we want to apply migrations on the tenant DB context. That's our central database. Then using that context, which has the tenant list, we're going to read the list of tenants and we'll loop through that list, reading any connection strings that the individual tenant has. And then just like we did in our tenant service, will apply any pending migrations. So first step, this is what the code looks like. Using the service collection, we pull uh, an instance of the tenant DB context, and we apply any pending migrations to that DB context. I'm also writing in the console here some notifications with a blue color so that we're able to see it here in the console. Okay, so next we'll get a list of tenants from that DB context. We'll also want to get the default connection from our app settings. 
and then we will loop through each of those tenants and we'll use their individual connection string when they provide one. Otherwise, we'll use the default connection string. And then we'll pull the instance of their database and apply any pending migrations to it. So now, this is our completed add and migrate tenant databases extension method, which we will wire up to our app startup. And we'll do it right here. So builder services add and migrate tenant databases, and then we pass in the configuration. So that will run this every time the application starts. Now, because this extension method uses application DB context, we need to move this iCurrentTenant service, the registration, we need to move that before this triggers. So let's test this new extension method by going into the product entity and let's just add a new string field called supplier and then let's go down to package manager console and let's apply this new migration to the application DB context so this is the command I just ran add migration the name of it add field to product passing in the context application DB context and the output directory migrations app DB so this is what we have scaffolded. Now I could run the update database command, but really I don't need to now because any pending migrations are gonna be applied programmatically when the app starts. So let's just run our application and then we'll check to see if this column was created in all of our databases. So let's go see now. I'm gonna close some of these windows. Uh, I'll refresh this. Okay, so now we should have a new column in products for supplier, and we do. So that's the beta tenant database. Here's the alpha tenant database, and here's the central DB. And the new column is created in every database. If we were to create another tenant now on their own database, then that new database as well would contain all of the latest migrations, so they also have the supplier column. Now you may think we're finished, but you will get an error in one highly specific scenario. The scenario is this. If you were to try to add a new field to the tenant table, so for example, let's say that you added a new field called subscription level, and then you went to create that migration, you'll get an error. And the error says, unable to create an object of type tenant DB context. If you added new tables to the tenant DB context, that would be okay. You still wouldn't get the error. You'll only get the error if you add a field or do any modification to the tenants table on this context. So the problem is this, where we read a list of tenants from the tenant DB context. The issue is that we can't read from a table that's being modified during design time. We can, but we have to tell Entity Framework which connection string to use during the design time. And they actually provide an interface for that. To implement that, we'll create a new class in the models folder called tenant db context factory. And we will implement this interface idesigntime context factory. And the rest of the code looks like this. So the interface takes a db context. Well, this code right here is not critical, really. Uh, this is the critical code right here where we tell the DB context options builder specifically which connection string we want to use. And here you can just hard code in your connection string. If you want to be fancy, you can add this where we read the configuration from the app settings.json. So now if I run that same command, there's no problem and the new field should be added only to our main database and only on this tenants table. So that concludes the tutorial. This is very close to how multi-tenancy is implemented in the nano boilerplate, an essential starter kit for anyone wanting to build web applications today with .NET.
It also ships with three UIs with React, Vue, and Razor Pages implementations. So definitely check that out. Thanks for watching. Click subscribe. Till next time.